I think for me, being at a small college means that I work closely with students and their parents. And in any capacity that I've had, I've always really appreciated that. So I feel like I've seen a lot of do's and I've seen a lot of don'ts. Um, and, uh, but what I, what I really like most is working with students. You know, if, if you, the further I get from uh, working with students, the more, um, the less fun the work becomes. So you'll notice I didn't say parents, <laughs> mm -hmm. I said students. Um, and I think because at, when all is said and done in the admission office, um, we are educators. Um, as Eric noted in the conversation, we have institutional priorities that we have to meet. Um, as I noted, we have revenue that we have to make, 95% uh, I think, or I don't know, like most colleges in this country are revenue driven. So if we don't bring a class in, uh, that's a really big problem. We cannot, we cannot simply depend on our endowments. Um, so we have realities. Um, uh, that, that drive us, that drive our determination, but when all is said and done, we're still educators. Um, and just like any educator at any institution recognizes that that institution has its priorities and its needs, um, it exists in a competitive landscape. Um, you know, uh, I know that Gould is thinking about this, but the, the predicted population of students who are gonna to go to private education for high school in this country is gonna precipitously drop in the next decade. Um, so, so we have all of these competitive realities that we have to navigate, but at the end of the day, it is about the student and it is about the education. Um, I think that my colleagues and I, by and large, um, navigate that well. Um, and again, as I said, I said the students. <laughs> I, I didn't say the parents. Um, and that might not feel good, right? Like, I totally get it. I have a 10-year-old. I want to know what's going to happen. But at the end of the day, um, our obligation is to prepare the student for the future. You all might think you know what the future is, and, and you might. You might. Um, but how do you approach the future of those conversations um, with a, an honesty and an impartiality um, that is going to really condition your students with realities? And I guarantee you, I don't want any hardship upon my son. Like, I'm not preparing him for the college process by introducing him to hardship, right? I'm not thinking about what's his future going to be because I want it to be this. Like, I want him to be happy. I want him to have options. Um, I am totally biased. I have to admit, as an educator who's done this for 20 years, I might not know. I might not know what that is, right? Those are really difficult realities. Um, I would encourage you to embrace those today. Um, because that's really, I think, what's going to set the stage for a really powerful and profound admission process. Um, so yeah, it was really funny. I was talking to a bunch of the big New York private schools have this conversation. And, um, and, and a lot of it, they said, well, you know, how, how do I present my son or my daughter has overcoming challenges? I said, what? I said, what? what do you mean by that? And it's like, well, it seems like everybody has to have, like you have to overcome something to get to college. Uh, tell me more. And, and it occurred to me, something occurred to me that goes way back to when I started admissions. Um, and I, I don't want to conflate the issues, but um, 20 years ago when I started at this work, um, in particular, I started multicultural recruitment. Um, 
the lack of success among these really elite colleges, including the Ivies, at becoming diverse institutions was profound. We were failing. We couldn't figure out how to create diversity. We, we couldn't figure out, and again, it had to do with how do we create diversity in the most equitable way, right? Because a lot of people say, well, you did diversity by cutting standards. Absolutely not. Like if Bowdoin falters in its standards, that's, that's unacceptable, right? So we had to figure out how do we do this in a way that we appreciate what these students have overcome and, and the, the standards of this institution. Like how are we gonna accomplish that? And I think a lot of this grit conversation starts there. And, and it, was the, it was brilliant, right? Like it enabled us to change these campuses in ways that were so profound. But then that idea got into the market, mm. <laughs> right? And I heard saying, well, actually, you know, like this has to be the way you get into these selective colleges. Um, and what I would say is that I think that's misleading, right? Like we didn't, as I said, we don't wake up and say, well, you know, like, how am I going to throw you in some life altering scenario that's going to really harm you to the point that you're going to get into college? What, how do I expose you to extreme poverty so that you get into college? I mean, when you start to think about it, that's, that's really kind of perverse. But, but it, it got out there, right? It became a part of the conversation. It became a part of the market landscape. Um, and I would say, really, push against that. You know, because not every student has a hard story. Um, so one do is really seek to know the college. Um, and this is what I was saying earlier. Um, colleges exist in a competitive landscape. Like even Harvard, like you, you heard Eric say, like they're really conservative because they know that when they get, when Brown gets to their, that past that 35% of their early decision, that they're gonna have this pool that they really want, but they have to compete for, right? Mm -hmm. so, so all of us exist in a competitive landscape that might be relative, um, you know, but, but we exist in that. And so we're trying to understand like who gets us, like who understands these places? Um, and colleges are cultures. Like, is Gould a culture? Right? It does, is, does anybody who comes to Gould say, oh, this is just for me? Right? So that's a culture. So how do you understand that? How do you tease out what that is? Um, and I know we send a lot of material, and the young woman was totally right to point us out, to call us out on it. Um, you know, um, but I, I do feel like, I was honest, and I do feel like we, we've been better. Um, but the, the eye-opener was I do have, uh, I have a brother who's 11 years younger, and um, at one point I, I went home to visit my dad and my stepmom in New York City, and he went to Stuyvesant, so this big New York public, and they pulled out three milk crates of material. Because I, I'd asked, Erroneously, I, I thought, well, great, I can get all this, I can look at all these publications to see like what's really good and what's not. And my stepmom pulls out three milk crates, uh, the big ones, not the little squares, um, of material. And I got to Bowdoin, and, and we had sent him, I think, four view books. And, and these were like, I don't know if you've seen the Bowdoin view books, but they're like, they're like bigger than life, you know, they're humongous. Um, but so, so one, think about the money that we're expending, da, 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 but I would also say that those material, I mean, that, that's us. Like, that's our culture. Like, we've, we've poured it into there. And yes, we've hired marketing firms, we've hired all of this slick publication people to help us with it, but, but that's our culture. A lot of that stuff we've moved online um, so that we can send out kind of thinner or, or less material, but um, I'd really encourage you to really dig into that. But the problem is, is that you're under so much pressure to apply to more and more colleges. How is it that you're really gonna do a thorough review? How is it that you're gonna dig so deep that you're gonna be able to understand the culture? 
So I have a question for you about that. Sure. Been, and I, I think it might be a don't as opposed to a <laughs> do. But there's, there are websites where you can read student reviews of schools. And they can actually talk a lot about They have multiple layers of questions about campus life, student life. Um, but you know, and as a parent, you can go read the ones that got the one star and the two star. And then you, as a parent, you're like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> you know? So do you, what do you, what's your thought on those types of things? <clears throat> I hate them, yeah. <laughs> but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that it's a don't. That just means I don't like them. Yeah. Um, I think they can be really useful, but you have ever. I, I would say come up with a structure that makes sense. Like first, so first know your colleges. Right. Right. So first know your colleges, and again that goes back to my other point. It's like you have to be strategic. You really have to isolate and identify the places that you're really going to dig into. Like if you're shooting for 20 colleges, you're not going to be able to dig into all of those. And don't presume that because we make every college look the same, that they are the same. Most higher ed, we, we kind of, I would say we share about 95% of the same fabric. Because we're colleges, yeah. right? So we should look very similar. Like if we don't look similar, you should ask yourself some questions about why and is that attractive? Actually, Bennington won't look similar, right? Um, so, so most of the fabric is shared, but that 5% matters, right? And, and so what you're trying to do is understand that. You're not gonna be able to do that when you're looking at 20 to 30 institutions. You might be able to look at numbers, like you know, when the institution was founded, curriculum and program like you'll be able to distill the summary statements but to really know the place you're not going to be able to do that so so first is really targeting in on a number of institutions that you feel are practical you know working with your guidance working with your counseling office and that you the student and to some extent you as a parent are really willing to dig into but if your student's not willing to dig into it I would say that's problematic I have a question for you. So my son is interested in this specific area of study. How do you have any practical tips on how to evaluate different institutions for that particular program? Yes. So let's. So so one. Let's structure this. Okay. So we're we're dealing with that. You know, right? So now you've done your research and you know the institution. What next? And actually, this is the next point. So the next thing is. Now that you've studied the institution, you kind of have a sense of it culturally, does the institution offer you, the student, what, what the student needs, right? And how do you understand that? You know, so Yuki and I were talking about like, you know, his interest in the sciences, but also like, you know, do you, do you want a culture where there's a lot of international students? Do you want a culture where there's a lot of diversity? Or maybe you don't. Maybe you come from uh, an environment where you want something that's really different from that. That's fine. So, so understanding the, the, the place at that cultural level, but also does it meet the needs of the student? Like does a student want to play sports? Do they want to ski? Do they want to have, um, uh, does it have the academic program? And then the next level is like how do you assess that? Um, and I think, I, I actually, I think the academy is so varied. Um, that this becomes a little bit difficult, but it's not really saying is this a good program like so yeah You can look at does this program send X number of students to these graduate schools? I think that's always interesting, but I think more interesting is that Is the faculty there are the faculty doing things it might not be a specific interest of your son or daughter But is the faculty doing things that your son and daughter wants to do with their academic studies and maybe you might ask, how will this institution engage my son and daughter at that academic level? Um, you know, smaller colleges, there might be hands-on research um, that the student includes the faculty, but chances are that that's not gonna necessarily, there's so much that a student might wanna do that it's probably not gonna directly align, but they're gonna get hands-on research, right? A larger institution might have a plethora of areas of research that might say, oh, I'm really interested in that, but the student will be doing that research with a teaching assistant, which isn't a bad thing, but it's different. 
Um, so then you have to say, well, well, what matters? Like, what's the context in which I want my son or daughter to in, engage this material? So yeah, you can look at graduate rates and rates that go on to programs, but I would say look at the engagement. You know, and what's the engagement that you think would be sufficient to really promote that student in the studies and give them exposure to things that are really going to energize them. And students, I would say that's a, the same for you. Like, look for engagement. Where are you going to be engaged? Where are you going to be energized? And again, it, it, it doesn't have to be with a faculty member. It might be, like, you might be so content specific that it's really just about the content and finding engagement in that content. But you might say, well, you know, I have a general sense of this field, but I'm not sure how deep I want to go. And so maybe then at this point, it really is just about engaging the faculty and getting a sense of what's available and how to do the research, right? So it's going to be different for every, every student. So, so one, we have understanding the list that you presented with, understanding does it meet uh, the specific needs. So these are all do's. Um, and then third, now that you've done that, now that you've done that and you have a sense of why you're showing up at the doorsteps, um, it's, I think it's fine to look at those, those tertiary statements. You know, and so then you can say, well, you know, in a thoughtful way. Because <laughs> some of that stuff is, is really unthoughtful and it's just chatter and it's just junk. Um, the college confidential, the college confidential stuff. Websites, yeah. but, but like to say like, you know, I saw this and once you see it, you can't unsee it. And to say, to give the admission office the chance to really answer that question. And if they answer it sufficiently, believe them. Because, you know, who knows? Those are open forums. Like anybody can go on, anybody can drop some stuff out there, you know? Sure. And so, you know, you yeah, have to take it. One person's looking for it may not be what another person's looking for. So it's just yeah. a fit issue. So, so you I'm have to. I'm thinking what a great assault. I mean, the person who's giving the one-star review is an unhappy student. So. Yes. And so you have, that's what I mean, is that you have to know the place first. And you have to know why you're yeah. there first or the student's there first. Yeah. And then if you look at that stuff, you'll take it with a great assault and um, you'll be able to answer yeah. informed questions. Or you might say, you know what, this is ridiculous. Like, this yeah. isn't my student. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, think about the structure that makes sense for your student, your family, and really stick to that. But um, the other thing to do is, um, you know, this, uh, you, your child is going to college. You know, you know not, not you. Um, and, well, to create the framework for that decision making to exist is really important. Um, and, and I feel, you know, again, who knows where I'll be in eight years, seven years when my son is looking at colleges. <laughs> but I really want him to be, be the best friend of all his parents. His friends yeah. Parents. <laughs> but I, I want him to be, I, I feel like I want him to be empowered. Um, I've really appreciated some of the conversation that has come out in the media recently about fear of failure. And, and I really wonder what that's doing to students. Um, because college is about failure. It's about setting an environment where students can fail, dust themselves up, get back up, and, and, and try harder. And it's very safe, right? A D doesn't feel good, but it's just a D. Like, an, a D in real life, I don't know. An F in real life, I don't know. But the students have to be willing to kind of step up and step beyond those fears. And so I really encourage you to set a framework for um, your son or daughter to be empowered in their decision making, to um, really trust them, to really trust their instincts. I said to the earlier group here that um, causal development, um, as a uh, student who want to study psychology, um, isn't formed until like the mid twenties mm -hmm. of the late, late and, you know. And for me, I'm still working on it. Um, you know, so so um, to realize that 
there are a lot of things that impact the decision making about like if I do this, this will happen. Right. But it's not to say that they don't know. It's just to say that there's a lot of chatter that gets in the way of that. And I think as families, how can you help reduce that chatter? How can you help um, your students to trust their decision making? Um, and I think that's actually really hard to do, but I would challenge you to try to do that because that, that will help your son or daughter when they get to college and, they're, and you're not there. And they really do have to trust their decision making. There's um, a wonderful book downstairs I'll just point you to on the table on resources of I'm going to college, not you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's written by, uh, well, it's edited by Jennifer Del Hunty, who's the dean of admission at Kenyon for a number of years. Oh, Jennifer, yeah. And it's filled with essays by admissions professionals kind of reflecting um, on those experiences with their own children in many cases. Um, Steve, who is here today, wrote an essay that's in there. Um, but it's worth it's worth reading in terms of that decision making framework because as you were saying before that sometimes they may not seem like they're ready to make a decision. There's a lot of you know cognitive stuff that's going on in the background that may come out in a car ride or uh, an unusual place or in an unusual uh, words <laughs> um, that has a lot of truth in it. And, and many of those essays speak to revelations. Yeah. Talking to your children about the decision making process. And Jennifer is one of the best. I mean, she's been she dean at Kenyon for longstanding and a really profound voice in the in the admission world. Um, so, so you know, so there's the trust aspect. Um, I, I know I, I'm really actually sensitive to this. Like, I I've come to believe that high school students are like like you're so busy. Um, and, and, and truly busy, like truly doing things that I think are, are really impressive. I mean, like, I was a Boy Scout and I played lacrosse. I think that's all I did. And like, I had plenty of time to wander around aimlessly in New Jersey, Montclair, not New Jersey, because I would be bad. Um, Montclair's you know, in New Jersey. <laughs> well, Mont I grew up in Montclair. And, and I, I remember having a lot of free time, you know, and um, and students don't seem to have that today. And, and, and so, you know, and I, I'm getting at that sometimes parents, you do have to help, right? Sometimes it's just divide and conquer um, and really figure out like, what is it that you absolutely need your, your child to do? Like, I, I don't like the fact of like parents signing their students up for SATs and ACTs and test results and scheduling the interviews and stuff. I mean, if the more that the student can do, the better. But I also get it that they're really busy, and they're busy in ways that, um, you know, y you and I weren't when we were looking at colleges. And so we do have to be sympathetic about that. Um, but if, if you plan ahead enough, I mean, again, it's not like it's really that difficult um, to, to sign up for an SAT. Um, but you know you do have to have a credit card right and then there are some things that really students try to do and they're really difficult like when I went to graduate school like I went to Harvard I couldn't do the FAFSA <laughs> like that made my head spin it's like actually like, my wife was like could you please do this um, and I've been in admission for a decade mm. so like and there so there are some things that you absolutely have to do um, so, but, but really think about what that's going to look like. Um, and really, the more that your son or daughter, your child can do, the, the better. Again, to take ownership of the process. Um, I feel like uh, a lot that happens in enrollment is that we kind of get the students to abdicate their ownership. And what I mean by that is that we say, Yuki, it is so hard to get into Bennington, you know, but you know, you might get in, and we, we frame things in kind of cautionary language. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, only 10% of students get into Bowdoin. If, if I were on the other end of that, that wouldn't feel very good, mm -hmm. right? And it makes me think, well, these people own my life, whether I get in or I don't. But then remarkably, come like March 17th, you all get into a college, 
and you'll all get into a lot of colleges, many that are going to be incredible. And suddenly it's like you're long lost lovers, right? Like I've missed you. I haven't seen you in a day. Like, you know, you're not texting anymore. Like what happened? Like I'm having a dinner. You have to be there, right? Like it changes. And what I would say is remind yourself constantly, you're going to get it. You're going to get it. You're going to get it. And by doing that, also, what it's doing is that when you sit down with that interview, and if the person I hired to interview you is a jerk, you're going to get up and you're going to say, wow, the person's a jerk. Do I really want to be a part of this? But if you abdicate that ownership, what you see is the admit rate. And you don't see our behavior towards you, which sometimes can be profoundly upsetting and could be really disrespectful. So this is a question I've had as I've been going around to schools with my daughter. All you're talking about with this culture is I can find the culture in the view books and online. And then I've noticed that some schools do an exceptional job of reinforcing that culture in the tour and the presentation when you're on campus. Mm -hmm. And I've been at some other ones where I kind of went, I'm getting a different feel. It's not aligning. It, it's not aligning. And then I wonder, is it because who I got for a tour guide the day I went? Yeah. So I don't want to, we don't want to dismiss that school because of one, one of several different things. But as someone in the in the business, how do I how do we look past that? How do we do different things so that we can um, look past the really polished, awesome presentation on the day that wows everybody and goes like, man, if I this would be the place I would send anybody, and then you go to the other place and you're like, this is not aligning to what I thought it was. What did your child think? Like so again, like there's there's your perspective. Right. So I'm curious, like what did your what did your child think? So you might have walked away with this, but did your, like, did your, did your student... She noticed the same. But did she go to some places where it was really polished and say, all right, I'm digging this, and yeah. go to some place that was really polished and say, I'm not? And similarly, like, you know, sometimes what you have to look at is that we may, we may believe there's a trend, but probably, actually, I find that the students key into it. Like, I wish, like, all of you students out there, like, I wish my mind was working like yours is. Like, mine is addled. It's not creative. <laughs> like, it's lost so much of the flexibility that I once had to approach the world. And that flexibility was greater when I was your age. Like, it didn't make any sense to my parents. <laughs> You know, my Japanese and my Jamaican parents, it, it didn't make any sense to them. But in retrospect, when I stepped on Bowdoin's campus, like I said, this is it. Mm -hmm. And I was the kid who, we went to Brown and I was like, get me back in the car, mm -hmm. right? So again, like there's something happening that um, the students access, which is so much more profound um, that I really, you, you can call it instinct. I suspect that if you really deconstructed it, um, you could find the points of um, continuity. Um, but it's happening so much faster than, than we are now. And what we compensate for is that what we've become really good at as parents is the cost benefits. Like we're good at putting things into pluses and minuses and structuring out the, the conversation and and that's a huge asset and that's something that you can bring to your student and have a conversation about because you've been trained to do that that's that's the one of the gifts that college gave me is this analytic your students going to college to develop that and hopefully to retain some of that creative <laughs> energy but so I would say you know you're a lot of colleges are going to present themselves very differently, some well, some not. Sometimes those not well are going to be like, I still saw it and it still feels right, 
Mm -hmm. And sometimes if really polished are gonna be like, no. Like even though it was. And the trick is to really figure out, again, does does that make sense for the student? Um, so it, there isn't there isn't a I mean, I suspect you can find a reason. Um, but I think to step back and um, to not get caught up in the presentation, but to determine what was the student feeling, why did they feel that, and then to introduce, oh, this is what I saw. Like again, after the fact, like don't, don't do that first. Don't present the cost benefits because the cost benefits look profound. Like anytime you roll out data, like I can roll out a whole bunch of numbers and you're like, oh, that makes great sense. And I'm like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> but so talk about how it felt first. Talk about that, really tease it out, and then say, okay, you know, you know, there's some cost benefits out there that I want to run by you, and just to do a gut check. Um, so that would be a way to, to approach that. Um, but ideally, you know, let the student do it all, you know, right? But as I said, like, it's, I have to appreciate that the parenting that you have to do today is very different from the parenting that our parents had to do, uh, their parents and parents had to do. And at some point, you have to, within the context of your family, find that stride that makes sense. Um, ultimately, with the objective of kind of empowering your student and giving them the final say and reminding them that they got this, like, like they got this. What other questions are, are out there? Uh, I'm so sorry, uh, we, we don't have much time, so uh, it would be the last question. And if you have a question. You can have the final word. <laughs> <laughs> I have one do. Can I have a do? Yeah. Okay. And I have one don't. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> do. Um, parents, if there are financial constraints on, on how you're going to appro approach where your child goes to college, please have that conversation with your children. You may not be in the habit as of parents as talking about in talk of, talking about money with your children, but this is the time to do it. Um, and there have been times when students have really been blindsided by what the financial reality was at the end of the game. Um, and we really encourage students to lean into the conversation if you haven't asked your parents, what's our plan for paying for college? What's my responsibility going to be? What are you able to pay? Um, be brave and ask the question. And if, and if you're the adults in the room, I encourage you to, to open that. If, if, the, if money is not an object, that's good information for them to have as well, to tell them we have the resources to pay for college, we won't be applying for financial aid. But if you're applying for financial aid, start the conversation and do some of the preparatory work about um, the FAFSA forecaster, which will tell you what colleges may expect you to pay. Um, and, and start to look at that because it really is part of the equation and your we college counselors will help um, with finding financial fits in addition to these other kinds. Yeah, I would, uh, sorry, I would add the, as a personal finance teacher here, oftentimes in the fall, I will ask kids about how their parents save college savings of some sort. And most of them do not have a clue if you have a 529 account or any other plan for their college. And so letting them know that is, I think, very important as they go into this process. Um, because they're very nervous about calling you or asking you about that. And, and they feel off, off guard that they may not, there may not be a plan. There's an expectation I go to college, but there may not be a plan because they've never been a part of it. Yeah, the, the Mitchell Institute in Maine uh, about a decade, over a decade ago, identified that by having conversations with students about family finances, that not only did it improve going to college rates, it actually improved uh, four-year graduation rates. So that conversation sets the stage for, um, for so much more to happen in terms of student success. So I, ju I would just reiterate that. Um, my don't don't approach the college process as stump the chump, right? Like a lot of times you'll have an info session and the parents will be there really to try and figure out what the admission officer doesn't know. There's a lot we don't know, you know? And I think the idea isn't to, you know, some families really choose a confrontational approach to those sessions. Um, 
that's not really helpful. Um, and you'll probably be in a session where somebody is doing that. Um, and really approach those by really thinking about what are the questions that you need answered. Um, and, and give the admission officer, because unfortunately, um, we have a lot of turnover in our field. Um, and so oftentimes you might get a younger counselor who might freeze up. And, and I would say, kind of think about that. Remember that just like, you know, I remind my staff that there's a student on the other end, but there's someone else on the other end of your questions, on the other end of reading that file. Um, so the idea isn't really to kind of corner an admission officer into re releasing the faults of the institution. It's about talking about their experience, giving context for that. Um, a lot of the information you might find online. And also, you can also say, okay, if you ask a question and the, and the person doesn't get it, just say, oh, well, you know, is this something that you could find out for me? And, and get their business card and use that as an entree to start a conversation with someone who might be the reader for your student. But if you put them on guard, um, what you end up doing is kind of derailing the info session in that conversation. So again, like just in everything you do, be thoughtful. Be thoughtful about your child. Be thoughtful about the other person on the other end of that conversation. Um, be thoughtful about how you support your student in this process. Um, it is a hard process. You know, I really wish, I wish that it didn't drum up the amount of anxiety that it does. Um, and if anything, you know, really um, try to bring that anxiety down. Try to have fun. Um, one of the things that I worry the most about in my work and at any institution is that the college search takes so much out of the student that when they start college, it's like, I just need to rest because I've been through that. And if you feel that that's happening to your son or daughter, think about, Am I going to waste a year of money to pay for them to rest? Or do I want to create a college search process that's going to really enable your son or daughter or child to be energized to engage college? And actually, that's the best way to maximize the expense, right? So really seek to create something that's energized, that's fun, that's really going to enable the student to start on the strongest foot possible. You know, always keep that in focus. Cool. Well, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.